Hi everyone and welcome to the first of my videos interviewing people who are doing great things in the legal profession. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Emma Cal. Hi Emma. Hi Sammy. <laughs> so Emma is a real estate solicitor. She's recently become a consultant and not only that but she's in her own words on a mission to start a legal revolution. So I'm definitely on board with that. Um, so Emma, if you could just start off by telling us a bit about yourself and your journey into law. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so as Sunny said, I'm Emma. I'm a real estate solicitor. I'm originally from Sheffield and then moved to Manchester mainly for work. Um, my background was always in sort of medium to large firms dealing with commercial property and mainly development um, aspects of commercial property. Um, I originally got into law by watching Legally Blonde on repeat, basically. <laughs> um, I thought you walked around the office giving snaps to people and uh, had a little chihuahua, but um, unfortunately that's not actually how it is. Um, so yeah, watched a lot of Legally Blonde and it made it look like, well, it made it seem possible that girls could change the world and you could show up just as you were in your pink suit if that's what you wanted to do and you could change the world and that's what. I wanted to do so um yeah started out in law really just from watching that um then did law at college and university and it turned out by chance that I was actually quite good at it um so sort of yeah fell into it through Elle Woods I'd say <laughs> that's really nice to hear because often you hear people saying I wanted to be a lawyer since I was five or I want to promote justice and to actually hear such an authentic story wow I watched Legally Blonde and I loved it um I have to admit I love Legally Blonde as well um and also I watch a bit of Suits at the moment <laughs> I'm not sure I've never admit seen, that. seen Suits I'm still um, I'm still not like I'm trying to stay away from it for as long as I can because I think it'll just leave me really disillusioned <laughs> yeah yeah that's how I was like and then I was like let me just give it a watch and now I'm obsessed <laughs> <laughs> Um, so going back to your journey, obviously, so now you're a um, consultant solicitor. What made you leave private practice? Yes, yeah, so I've been a consultant for um, around like seven or eight months now. So since um, June, July time last year, um, I prior to that I was in an employed role. Mm -hmm. And if I'm being honest, was close to burnout. Um, the stress and the pressure and the demand of the job were all just taking its toll. I think that combined also with the fact that for the like sort of 18 months prior to that, we'd been in a pandemic and I hate to use the, the word because it's completely overused, but it was so unprecedented. <laughs> yeah. um, nobody had been through that before. And I think those two things coming together, so the change of circumstances that the pandemic brought about and also just feeling like I, I couldn't take any more stress or pressure combined to make me think there's got to be something else it's got this can't be it this is not what I signed up to do for the rest of my life yeah and um so left my employed role not really knowing what I was going to do next I just knew that I couldn't carry on in that role mm -hmm. um so left had four weeks where I was looking at other options and just taking a bit of time to come back together and then by chance came across Gonna Cook which is the consultancy firm that I work under now um, and really got into looking at how a consultant operates there's, there's not that much information I didn't find out no. there about what consultants are or how they work um, so I started looking into that and felt that it was worth a try. I didn't know if it was going to be any good or not, but it was worth a try. I've got nothing to lose at that stage. Mm -hmm. um, so started out and yeah, it's it's had its ups and downs, but on the whole, I think it's been a really good, a really good move for me. Um, I'm really enjoying it. Okay. Um, so you said, obviously, you left your role first and then um, you found the sort of consultancy position. Had you heard about sort of consultant solicitors before is being self-employed something that you thought about or did you just literally want to change and then you came across becoming a consultant yeah so I had heard of Gunna Cook but 
it always seemed to be a bit of a mystery. It was this like magical <laughs> place where there was no, there's no time recording targets and no billing targets and you were in control of your clients. But other than that, I didn't really know how it actually worked in practice, how I didn't particularly even understand the whole consultancy model that you could be a self-employed solicitor. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, sort of fell into it. I've always been fairly entrepreneurial. So that actually being self-employed and starting my own company that I now operate through wasn't particularly daunting for me because Mm. um, I'd always been interested in sort of business and setting up businesses. But um, yeah, it was a whole new world to realize that you could be self-employed but still be a solicitor. (laughs) Okay. And then how did you then find the transitions, considering you hadn't really considered it before sort of falling into it? It's, um, well, I went into it thinking this is your chance to not do things the same as you've always done them. This is your chance to make a change. So everything that I didn't particularly like about being an employed solicitor, I had this great opportunity to change it. Um, But even though on paper, it sounds like such an amazing um prospects such an amazing opportunity um when you actually get into it it's so much harder to make changes than you think it's going to be because we're so conditioned that you get up and you log on and you're at your desk for nine and then you work till whatever time and you might have half an hour for lunch and we're so pre-programmed to just Mm. doing things the way we're used to that the hardest thing that I found was getting out of that mentality yeah so um to really think actually you don't have to be at your desk at nine if you don't want to be as long as there's no no client need for you to be there you can have three hours for your lunch if you want you can go food shopping at two o'clock on a Tuesday if you want to (laughs) um that complete freedom really did take quite a lot of getting used to um it is different being self-employed because you are responsible for how much you earn essentially so it's on you to take on enough work that you can support yourself but also not to take on too much that you're not feeling overwhelmed and that is a really tricky balance because when people are coming to you saying oh we've got this job you know your fees will be x amount Mm. it takes a lot of strength to say I'm not going to take that one on because actually I've got too much else on or because I don't want to be overwhelmed um and yeah that's still something I'm trying to get to grips with I I really am bad at taking on too much work because you think oh you just see the pound signs and think yeah. I'm going to keep taking it on um so it's definitely a learning curve and I am fairly new in my journey to it yeah. um but it's been great so far Okay, I think that is an issue for lawyers generally. We just don't like saying no. So, and I suppose as a self-employed solicitor, because it's your salary that basically is determined by the work that you do, it's even harder to say no. Um, So yeah, that's definitely, I understand that's probably quite difficult to learn. Um, Yeah, we're huge people pleasers, I think, aren't we? As a um industry (laughs) exactly something that we definitely need to work on (laughs) yeah um do you reckon there's anything that you've learned as a consultant solicitor that would have been quite useful when you're in private practice yeah I think so there's there's so many transferable skills that in private practice particularly in the size of firms that I was working in where you had all the support teams so you had all the teams doing the marketing and the business development and you had the finance teams I never really had that much involvement in sort of the back end stuff so um taking like billion as an example in the firms I'd worked at previously you filled in a little sheet online that said I want to raise a bill and then it went off and the bill fairies raised the bill and I never knew whether the bill got paid or not. I didn't particularly care whether the bill got paid or not. There was no effort on me to be involved in that process any more than just thinking, okay, we've come to the end, I'm going to bill what we've agreed sort of thing. Whereas now, the way that um, the consultancy model generally works, particularly at Gunner Cook, is that I don't get paid until the client pays their invoice. So Hmm. there's sort of a time lag between when I take on a client or take on a matter and when I actually get paid for that work. 
So we'll invoice a client, the client pays, and then I then get my percentage out of that. Mm -hmm. um, that model focuses your mind so much more sharply on billing and fees yeah. and making sure the client pays. Um, so a lot in real estate, we're quite lucky in that a lot of what we are doing and the types of transactions are doing, there is money moving, which mm -hmm. makes it much easier to collect or retain money for your invoice on completion. Mm -hmm. um, but I would just never have done that in, in private practice. I would have never yeah. have retained money out of completion proceeds for a bill because I didn't need to. So mm -hmm. um, that side of things, I think, is definitely a useful skill that I've picked up, just having mm -hmm. a better awareness of how and when we're billing the client and whether that client's actually paying. Mm -hmm. um, if, if all firms, if everyone in firms had that focus, there wouldn't be such a huge debtor list that there is at some of these yeah. big firms. Yeah. <laughs> um, I also, like on the business development side, so building up your connections, mm. um, then the firms that I worked at, there was never particularly a pressure to get involved in business development. So it always felt like there were certain people that loved business development and would take on all the business development opportunities and then if you weren't as bothered or you were perhaps slightly shyer or a bit more introverted as I was there was never any pressure to put yourself out there and to do business development yeah so I just chose not to do it because I didn't need to do it but actually now when you're self-employed and to a certain extent the onus is on you to be getting the clients in to be getting the work in you realize how much more important it is at that stage to have a personal brand and to have contacts and to retain contacts that you've met along the way so um I'd say business development skills as a general topic would be so much more useful if we were actually taught how to do it properly and effectively yeah. um, and if everybody had a chance to practice that no matter whether you were employed or self-employed. Hmm. Okay. And um, would you say you now enjoy it? Obviously, you didn't like it initially when you were in private practice doing business development. Um, I still don't enjoy the networking <laughs> events where you walk into a room of people and you don't know anyone. Oh, yeah. That still takes a deep breath of like, come on, we've got this, let's just go in. Yeah. But what I have learned, which I didn't particularly know before, is that business development is so much wider than just yeah. those horrible networking sessions so <laughs> it is it's about building your online presence doing things like this yeah. making sure you're posting on LinkedIn chatting to people on LinkedIn yeah. but also in your everyday life seeing just general people that you meet as an opportunity so obviously yeah. I'm not going out and doing the hard sell on every single person I come across but just being open to chatting to people finding out what they're into finding out what their background is because so many people have connections that you would never have known if you weren't open to having different chats with a wide range of people so mm -hmm. yeah I still don't like the cold room on no. a Thursday evening walking in that still fills me with dread but <laughs> I do enjoy the the wider scope of business development work which yeah. I probably didn't even think about before yeah I think the pandemic has also helped that because for me, I absolutely hated that sort of walking into a room, not knowing anyone. But for me anyway, doing these sort of online events or talking to people online is so much easier. So yeah, I completely get that. Um, yeah. Talking about branding, obviously I mentioned at the start of the interview, um, so you, it's not your only brand being a um, real estate solicitor. You're also part of this legal revolution um, to improve the profession. Tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so there is such a huge mental health crisis, a mental health epidemic in the legal industry that I know that I, how I felt was not limited to just me. And it wasn't even limited to the firms that I'd worked at either. It's completely industry-wide. Yeah. Um, and I think it comes from... The nature of the people that are doing the job, as we were saying, the perfectionists, the people pleasers, <laughs> we're always going to go that extra mile. We always want to be the best that we can be. Yeah. But also the industry and the clients that we tend to work with are clients that will take, 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 take. So mm -hmm. you can give the best you've got and do the best job possible and run yourself into the ground doing that. But the nature of the job is that 
someone will say, okay, yeah, that's great. Now what can you do next? Now what's next? What are you going to do tomorrow? We finished that deal, now on to the next one. You, you never reach that stage where you think, I'm the best that I can be and someone was amazingly mm. happy that I have been the best that I can be. Yeah. It never felt quite worth it for me. Yeah. Um, and sort of this time last year when I was thinking, this has got to a head and I can't carry on doing this anymore. I've got to make a choice. It's either carry on in this job and run myself down or I'm going to have to choose me and get out and protect my mental health mm. and I got out and I chose me but that was a really scary decision to make because yeah. it, you've got job security you've got a lovely salary you've worked hard to get there to then turn you back on that and say I see all that but actually my mental health is more important was a really scary decision to make but at that time when I was making that decision I found that there was very limited information out there about what other options listers had. So if you do a Google for what jobs can you do if you've got a law degree, really generic answers come up, but nothing that's actually useful, nothing that you could say, all right, maybe I will go on and do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but also that there was very few people I could talk to that were complete, completely impartial, but also understood how I was feeling and what that job was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so all my family were invested in it because they'd seen how hard I'd had to work to get there. My partner is a solicitor, so he does understand the industry. But mm-hmm. at the same time, we've got a nice house and he needs someone to help pay the bills and the mortgage. Um, my friends were or are largely from a legal background. So it felt like if I was going to go to them and say, hang on a minute guys this is not working I was criticizing their job not just mine yeah so it felt like I really had nowhere to turn to so what I am focusing on now is working as a mentor for people who felt the same way that I did so they're in the legal industry they've perhaps been doing it for a few years and they're now thinking I can't carry on doing this it's running me down there's got to be something more Mm. um So working as a mentor with those people to either look at ways that they can improve their current working practices. So putting in place better boundaries, having difficult conversations with their manager, perhaps about their working hours or their workload, being a real support system for those processes to happen. Or separately, if people are thinking, I've had enough of being employed and I want to look at other options, to work with them, to look at their options and put an action plan in place really for how they're going to get from where they are um, at that stage to where they actually want to be. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's a service that is so needed because there is, no one wants to have the honest chats about how hard it is because Mm -hmm. it feels slight, or I at least felt like a bit of a failure, but I'm saying I can't handle this. I can't cope with this. Mm -hmm. And that didn't sit well with me. So Nobody really has the honest chats, um, but I'm determined that the industry itself needs to change. And the only way it's going to change is if people start speaking about it. So whether that's just making changes in the way that they personally work or saying, hang on a minute, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to look for other options. Firms are going to have to take notice if yeah. enough people speak out. Yeah, definitely. Um, so that was a really long answer. No, <laughs> yeah, no, that's really good. I mean... You're absolutely right what you're saying. And I think the only way that we'll have changes having these discussions. And like you say, if more and more people leave to say, go self-employed or choose models that are better for mental health, then private practice will need to change because there's going to be no one left. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And um, I suppose as part of that, you've got a new website as well, haven't you? Yeah, so I set up a website firstly to act as an information source so that if people are googling what can I do if I'd hate my job when I've got a law degree (laughs) there is there's an information source with some um sort of signposts to other options um but secondly to act as this mentoring community so that people can either connect with me or be connected with other people who will be able to help them either assess their options or put action plans in place Mm. so the website is lawlifemanchester.co.uk um yeah so using that as an information platform and as a connection tool to bring all of this together really yeah 
and I'll pop a link to that in the description as well so anyone watching this can go have a look I've actually been on your website I've read all the blog posts it's absolutely brilliant I love it so oh, um, yeah, definitely it's definitely it. it's definitely a work in progress but it's out there in its early mm. days form and we're going to take it from there yeah brilliant I look forward to seeing how it develops <laughs> me too <laughs> <laughs> Um, so my final question before I let you go is something that I ask um, everyone that I speak to. What's your top tip for looking after your mental health and well-being? That you've got to always come first. So um, I read a quote from Glennon Doyle that I'm probably not going to get right, but essentially it's saying the only person you need to worry about disappointing is yourself. So make your decisions in such a way that you don't disappoint yourself you you need to be your top priority so in, when I chose to leave my job it was absolutely a decision to choose me and that isn't a decision that generally people take you run around and you're pleasing everybody else whether it's family or friends or your partner or whatever yeah. um you're taking so many other people into consideration and you need to always put you first so yeah. If you feel run down, then take that step back. If you spot your warning flags, then start taking action, start thinking about the things that you can change, but always prioritize you and don't be worried about disappointing other people if it's to, to prioritize you. That's such a lovely note to end on. That's brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Emma. That was really interesting. And um, so thank you to everyone for watching and see you all soon. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sunny.